Peace, love, blessings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to another episode of Life, Love, and Living Water. I got a special guest with me today. His name is Mr. Phillips, a.k.a. Uh, Greg Phillips, a.k.a. Philly for Chili. Let's go. A.k.a. Child of the King, man. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, Dre. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm That's good. awesome, man. I appreciate you taking your time to come on and share a conversation with me, man. It's a it's a blessing if... Uh, I mean, I could tell a story. I think I'll tell a story right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Greg is a... I'm sorry, was you about to tell a story? I was about to tell a story. Oh, man, go ahead. <laughs> okay, and then you can you can fill in. Sure. Um, uh, who's hosting this? Oh, anyway. So, uh, start of the school year, uh, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, I want you to pray four things. I want you to pray four things. I want you to pray them every morning when you do your prayer walk. So I prayed these four things. And um, some of them I felt like I had an idea. You know how, like, you pray for something, but you're, you're kind of sure you know how God's going to work it out. Mm. You know, we like to help him build his uh, plan a little bit. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm no newbie to this walk of faith, but I'm learning every day. So mm. I pray these four things, and on, on New, Year's, uh, New Year's Eve, we're down in Florida, and I just the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, stop praying those, and uh, I've already answered them. Mm. You were faithful, and uh, I've already answered them. And without going into a lot of detail, or at least at this moment, uh, this uh, podcast is an answer to one of those four, four prayers that I prayed from August you know, 17th through December 31st. So, really? um, yeah, it's just funny how to God be works. on this He's, podcast. Yeah. Not, not specifically this it's podcast, a, but, uh, to, yeah, I just, like I said, I talk all day and, uh, wow. h- how God orchestrated that. But when you sent that text, it's just, yeah. Okay. Never, never would have thought it would have been a podcast with a cool dude like you. Um, but here I am. I never dreamed I'd be doing podcasts with cool people like you, man. Yeah, I don't know about that, but here we are. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Greg, is a, he's a school teacher. How long have you been teaching? Uh, it's my 27th year. 27 years, man. Same school? Same school. Uh, f- fun fact, uh, half, uh, 0.54 years at East Clinton hmm. uh, down in Lees Creek, Ohio. Um, took over kind of a long-term sub uh, for a teacher that got, got ill. Um, and then started my uh, my first year was nine, 1998, 99 school year at Chukade High School. Hmm. Same same school I graduated from in 92. Wow. So so me and Greg, uh, I was thinking today, just like the first time we crossed paths, I was shooting some videos for a guy here in our town who was running for a uh, treasurer. We was shooting some promo videos, and we needed some actors. And one of the houses we ended up stopping at was your house. Yep. And you came outside, man, and you're just full of energy and... I think my first impression of you was like, I don't know if this dude's like cocky or full of himself or he thinks he's better than me or what. But uh, looking back, man, it was like the light that was inside of you irritated the demons inside of me because I wasn't in a place in my life where uh, I was surrendered to Christ. I was still battling addiction. Um, And so like the next couple of times we crossed paths after the Lord had filled me cleansed me uh, i knew without a doubt that this guy's the real deal he's got the (laughs) spirit of god in him you know you got such a light about you man i know a lot of people look up to you in our community so it really is an honor to have you on the show and i'm excited to hear what's on your heart a little bit yeah i'm excited to hear what's on yours too so uh me and me and greg got five questions as always prepared for each other and we'll see where it takes us. Do you Let's, want to go first? You want me uh, to go first? You hit it. You hit. You put it on the tee and hit it first. All right, man. Here we go. Uh, we'll just start with this, man. What's been on your heart lately? Man, what's been on my heart lately has been um, what's sitting right here on these pages, and that is, uh, man, we don't we don't know how to suffer very well as as followers of Jesus. Come on now. We we struggle with that deeply. Yeah. And uh, I'm only at that point. Um, having walked through a, a really rough patch, um, really the last, um, two years, two and a half years, but, but, um, w- we don't understand suffering and, and we, we keep, we have such a shame about, uh, suffering in the, the sense that it must mean we've, we've messed up or it means that we're not good or, uh, Unworthy. It, 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 we're, yeah. And how can a God that claims to, to be our father and we sing, you know, he's a good, good father and, uh, he either can stop it and he doesn't. I mean, that doesn't sit well with us. Um, and so that's that's kind of been really a theme of of kind of the trajectory of my ministry in the in the last couple of years is uh, the beauty of suffering, mm. the power of suffering. I mean, he says you're gonna 
you know, you're going to fellowship with me. Um, and he, and he also reminds us that, um, it's going to be in the power of his resurrection. And we enjoy that. We want the power, right? Yeah. I mean, who doesn't, I mean, that's not, that's an aphrodisiac. Nobody, yeah, we're going to skip past it. You're going to suffer for suffer. my name's sake. Yeah. And, uh, you're going to, in, in, in my fellowship, you're going to suffer. And we, Blessed if you suffer. Yeah. And we don't, we don't understand it. And so it has a, a real negative connotation. And I think we try to parse it out a little bit. Um, like my suffering, it was at my own hands or it wasn't at my own hands. And somehow we categorize suffering, right? Because like what a man soweth, he, he also reaps. Mm. And so I've sowed things and, and, and I've reaped them or I've made mistakes. And so the, the demons are just coming home to roost or uh, all of the things that, that we tell ourselves. And we either remove ourselves from the learning curve that God has built into suffering or uh, we we are hit out of kind of like I was hit out of nowhere with just really a, a gut shot that I didn't even know how to react, been, been in church my whole life and didn't even understand how to react to it. Mm. Um, and instead of, it took me a while to catch my bearings. And I realized I was not, I was not in any kind of spiritual maturity or any kind of spiritual shape to understand suffering. Um, and, uh, I, I think, I think we as, as followers of Jesus would do well to understand the beauty of, of suffering because it's the one thing that connects us all as followers of Christ. So we're, we're, you know, in, in this in this world, you're going to have troubles. Mm. So nobody gets away from it. Nobody gets out of this. Yeah. Nobody walks through this life scot free. Nobody uh, gets through. I don't care if you go live in the Swiss Alps in a tent um, and don't talk to anybody. Nobody gets through this life without sickness or uh, broken hearts or getting stabbed in the back or you know, addictions or, yeah. you know, we could name a million things. Nobody <laughs> gets through this life. So if n- it's the one thing that connects us, uh, should connect us as followers of Christ, but it's a shame attached to it. So it's really uh, what what the Holy Spirit's really been pushing me um, the last, especially the last six months of uh, as I've probably am the healthiest I've been mm. in a, about two and a half years. Like physically? Um Physically, I've I've always been pretty good. Physically, mentally, spiritually. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll put them all together, but but certainly, um, mentally, spiritually. That's um, awesome. Yeah, God God has done a, an amazing work. It's it's cool that you say that, man, because like, uh, you know, I've had to suffer recently, just lift different little things, uh, as far as like, even stopping vaping. It opens my eyes to see that, like, we continue doing things that are destructive for the sake of not suffering. Because it's like, I know that this ain't good for me. Sure. In so many different ways, not only for my health, but my image and, you know, what I stand for. But I don't want to suffer. And for me to stop doing this, it's going to cause me to suffer. Sure. But uh, I've also found that when we lean on him, man, nobody suffered like he did. No. So our suffering stacked up against his is so minuscule. In my own strength, I wasn't strong enough. But we never are. He gives me the strength. And it's like now, you know, I stopped to vape. There's a whole other beast in my life. Sugar. Sugar. <laughs> so <Ooh. laughs> Man, we could, we, Golly. Could, we could probably spend all night on that sugar. It's like a black hole opened up inside of me and... I'm filling it with all this junk food. Mm. So it's like, that's the next thing, man. To 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 fast right now would cause so much suffering. I ain't been able to do it yet, but uh, I know it's coming. That's awesome. And then um, even today, man, I uh, I suffered a lot with like this whole lust situation. Um, I downloaded Snapchat today this was pretty random but i downloaded snapchat today i ain't had snapchat for years um and they've changed it a lot man they've changed the platform a lot and it's like as soon as i open it up it's literally pages of women um pretty much selling themselves i mean they got all these seductive videos and images and then links to where you can go deeper if you want and so it's like Boy, that shook me today. And it's like I realized, like, man, you know, this is a platform that needs a light. It needs a light. But it's like you got to be, for me, I got to be so careful 
of whenever I'm opening these apps to know mm -hmm. the the evil that's lurking on it and that it will pull me into it if I let it. Um, thankfully, I was able to separate from that today, but I noticed that it totally killed my momentum. And I suffered because of it, because something inside of me, my flesh, wanted to continue the momentum that started and looking at these things and like, go deeper, go deeper to the point where it's like, I know there's so many things that I could do today that would be good and awesome and uh, worthy and honorable, but yeah. I couldn't pursue them because I was at such a yeah, unrest and a battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, for real, man, this podcast was kind of what kept me anchored because I've identified that whenever the Lord seeks to use me, when the Lord seeks to do something in my life, there's resistance that comes. Oh, for sure. And it comes in the ways that I fall the easiest. And so, like, if the enemy can get me to fall to the temptation of, of giving in to the lustful things, then I'm overcome with shame. And it kills my momentum for moments like this. Like, if I would have gave in and I would have, like, you know, took it there and did what my flesh wanted to do, I'd be riddled with shame right now. Feeling yeah. like I'm not worthy to talk about God. It's like, I mean, I, I got to text today. Greg and say, hey, man, maybe we can do this next week. <laughs> you know, it's like, so, uh, you know, I'm not feeling well, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm thankful, man. And uh, he's, I'm thankful that he's opened my eyes to yeah. see things. Well, I mean, we see um, when Jesus goes into the wilderness um, to kind of start his earthly ministry and he kind of pulls away. And there's, there's that moment where I think we all have to pull away. Um, we have to go into a kind of a place of solitude, and, and you know it doesn't mean you have to isolate yourself from your family, but uh, you know, and and of course the the devil shows up and he begins to tempt Jesus, and you know the things that he asked him to do in of themselves weren't weren't shameful. He said, "Hey, you know, take this this rock and make turn it into bread." Yeah. And you know the devil is a master at just bumping us off course. You know, I've, 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 my dad used to say this. My dad was a, just a super wise man, and he, he kind of had all these little homespun-isms that made sense. Huh. Um, he said, you know, you can, you can have a 20-foot wall, and if, you, if you're a 16th of an inch or, you know, 132nd of an inch off when you first start that trim, you mm. don't even notice it where mm, you started. Yeah. But if you run that the length of the 20, 20 feet, by the time you get to the end, It'll come up short. I mean, you're... you're two inches up the wall. I mean, you're trimming even on the floor because that gap grows and, and the, the devil's just trying to get Jesus off of his, his, his ministry. You know, he knows he's there to become one with the father. He's there to kind of initiate that, that start of his ministry. And the, you know, you talk about the, the Snapchat or, you know, anything that we deal with, it's often not even just gross sin. It's just something that gets us tension. Yeah. And now I'm fighting something that, that I didn't need to fight today. Yeah, it's like I, such an unnecessary thing that yeah, I wish and now I'm fighting exist. it when I'm supposed to be on mission. And this was not part of my mission. And it just happens now. I'm, you know, he's trying to just bump me a quarter of an inch off off level because he knows in a year if I don't correct that or if I don't allow the Holy Spirit to correct that or a brother or sister in Christ uh, to correct that in a year, that quarter of an inch out of my ministry is now I'm not even going to church. Now I'm not even a good husband or a father to my kids because I didn't make that small correction that would have even been noticeable to anybody. Um, but yeah, he's a master at just getting us just that that slightest little bit off off course, and uh, and to do that he just we we, we chase things, and uh, we 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 just become um, not very missional mm. sometimes. We all fight it. Yeah, that was a good story, man. Appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, because I think I it happens your advice, to. Man. Well, I don't know if it's advice. It's just, Are man. You, I mean, you know, everybody that's going to listen to this, you know, it's it's common to all of us. There's, There's no nothing. saying that man faces isn't common unto man. Yep. I mean, I remember if it's in Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, but man is a few days and full of trouble. Hmm. I mean, if you've ever ever been around a baby, man, it, it ain't a couple of days out of the womb and they're already. Mad, firing it up, screaming for food. Mm -hmm. I mean, man is a few days and full of trouble. I mean, it's 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 in our DNA until he changes and makes all things new. And uh, even then, man, it it doesn't it doesn't get easy, but it's absolutely worth it. Mm. It's good. What you so, got for me? Oh man! All right. So, what do you look at in your life? 
And I'm kind of coming at it from like creation when, when God just created something and he just looked at it and said, that's good. What do you look at in your life right now and just go, you know, that's good. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, first thing that comes to my mind is my wife. Um, the more time that goes on, the more time uh, I observe just other situations, man, it really opens my eyes to how blessed I am to have the wife that I have. Um, she supports me even in times where it's hard for her, times where she could be bitter, times where she could um, feel any certain negative way. Um, she's good at seeing the bigger picture. She trusts me. I trust her. And just having that support, man. Uh, we talked last night, and it was like just such a breath of fresh air. Her ideas, things that she could bring to the table. And for real, I feel like we're just dipping and dabbling in it. And I feel like there's so much locked up inside of her and even myself that whenever we can bring it together, it'll go so much further than we ever could have went without each other. So... Um, my wife is a good thing. That's awesome. I mean, here you are on a Friday evening, right? Six o'clock. And, yeah. you know, she's sharing her time with somebody like me. And uh, that's part of your ministry. But to have um, to have a, a life partner, to have a, a help meet like that is mm -hmm. an absolute blessing. And one I share, too. So I like that answer. Yeah, I can be out at one, two in the morning and run into somebody and they're like, you know, ain't your wife tripping at yeah. home? Like, she's sleeping, man. She's sleeping. What? You're lucky, man. I'm and like, you know what? I am lucky. He that finds a, a good wife findeth a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he puts us with the one that that probably kind of yings to our yang a little bit. You know, my wife is is really the opposite of me in so many ways, but she would have to be. If if she if she ran 24-7 like, like I do, my brain, I mean, our house would blow up. Mm. You know, she's the one that at times when I'm ready to go 157 mile an hour right through the drywall, she's like, that's great. How are you going to achieve that? I don't know. But if God's done Wham. it, if God Brick be wall. for me, who can be against me? You know, we get all of our uh, favorite scriptures out, right? Uh -huh. And uh, man, that's like, God. she's like, listen, I'm not saying God didn't tell you not to do it or God didn't bless you. And, but you know, you should probably pray on it for like more than five minutes, maybe, you know, fast. And uh, she's just kind of that, that uh, kind of calm to my, my fury because mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm always on the move. I don't sit, I don't, you know, and she, I can she, relate. she pulls me in a little bit sometimes and just says, Hey, uh, you know, it's family night. You need to take a deep breath and, you know, and, yeah. and if I didn't have that, I'd burn, I'd burn out. <laughs> yeah. She's my encourager, man. She encourages me. Um, helps me to see things through a different lens, corrects me. Yep. I hate to say it, she corrects me a lot of times. Should have just listened to the wifey. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm like that that's stubborn scriptural. cat, man. I that's gotta, scriptural. Got to hit it for myself. Tell yep. me something ain't hot. I want to touch it Oh, anywhere. yeah. I or mean, tell it, me something's hot not to touch it. I got to see. I got to gotta see for myself. How hot is it? <laughs> yeah. It's it's uh, it's amazing how that, that operates, that... Uh, you know, kind of uh, correction, because I, th I think we have such a mis kind of a, a misdiagnosis of of marriage from a biblical perspective, and uh, it's you know this whole idea of submission is is just such it's like such a dirty word. You know, nobody wants to talk about being in submission, and um, you know, submission does not mean passive. It does not mean uh, it does not mean that you don't have a place at the table. You know, when I was going through kind of my really rough place, I remember I was in bed. I was just feeling sorry for myself. And uh, we, my wife and I have a, a phrase that we've used. I think it's off a movie. I couldn't even tell you what movie it is. Um, it says, get off the cross. Somebody needs the wood. Hmm. You know, it's like when we put ourselves on the cross, you know, it's like, woe is me. You know, the whole world's against me, man. I can't believe this happened. And we'll both call each other out sometimes, you know, and say, Look, get off the cross. Somebody needs that wood for a camp campfire or something, you know, like, and, uh, I was just in a, I'd been in a, a bad place for a while. And I mean, she literally just kind of, kind of just 
grabbed me. Mm. And my wife is not a uh, very physical or violent person at all. And she just said, listen, 2 Timothy 1 and 7, and you are living in fear, and I don't know this man. I have never known you to live in fear, and you have operated, you are operating in the spirit of fear, and it is affecting our marriage, and it's affecting your relationship with your son and your daughter. It's affecting your health. It's affecting everything about you, and you'd better figure it out because the Bible says he's not given us that spirit of fear, mm. and you have no love, you've got no peace, and you've got no sound mind, or you've got no ability to, to, to reason in the spirit. That's gold, man got to have somebody in your life like that. Yeah. I mean, and I, I didn't even, I didn't even resist, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we get puffed up. Who are you to tell me, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm the breadwinner. I'm the, no, you're the idiot. It's what you are, mm-hmm. right? You being the idiot right now. And she's not afraid. I mean, we've, we've invested too much in our relationship over, over, you know, 27 years. We've invested too much to, You know, it's not about empathizing or sympathizing, but at some point we're not going down this road. I'm not going to let the enemy steal my family. I'm not going to let the enemy steal my marriage. And my wife was just like, listen, like you're living in the spirit of fear. And for 25 years of, of this, of our marriage, you've never operated in that. And it was funny because I would have never said I was living in fear. Hmm. That, that part I had to chew on, but she was pretty fired up in that moment. So I didn't offer any resistance. I just kind of listened because yeah. I knew for her to be like that was was really a, a serious, a, a serious, and it was really kind of a God thing because she doesn't press in like that unless it's like like she she really feels that it's kind of do or die now or never. Mm. But man, I like I can't thank her enough. Man, I can't. You can't put a price on that, right? For for a help meet for somebody that you're. Your partner in crime, your partner in raising kids and ups and the downs and you know, the you ain't got money to pay the rent and milk's too expensive and the you know, and the man gas, man, I can't make a cart runs on water or something. And mm-hmm. you know, you go through all these things and it's worth the investment, but it, it is an investment. So I owe a lot to my wife. And uh wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her, straight up. Amen. Thank God for our yeah. helpmates. Ooh. Yes. All right, man. I got another question for you. All right, hit me with it. Uh, this is kind of a different turn here. Okay. What kind of pain would you say you see the youth dealing with? Oh man. Um, there, it's an identity crisis. Um, it's it's for sure. Uh, <clears throat> there, there's too many voices in in their head. There's too many. Too many things coming at them. I mean, we we know, you know, scientifically, we know even spiritually, we know that being young is being impressionable. Mm-hmm. Not that not that you're not ever impressionable, but you gain wisdom, you gain, um, you know, you become more of an armor bearer as you you age, and and you're a little more resistant to things because you've seen this or, um, right. but being a kid, you know. From the earliest age all the way through probably, you know, early twenties, um, you know, the, the, it's an impressionable time, mm-hmm. and that the competition, it's kind of it's kind of strange because you know the competition for for the gospel is is almost like the gospel's losing so badly, because it's just one of the kind of dry, boring. Things that are out there that just not very attractive, yeah. and there's just so much glitz and so much glamour, and there's just so much, um, so much the world has to offer, and like whether it's Snapchat or TikTok or, you know, whether it's a podcast, and you know they're bombarded twenty four seven. They're really never disconnected from, you know, from their devices, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, you know when Jesus, wrote, you know when when he and Peter are talking and. You know, he asks Peter, and I think it was just a conversation starter. And Jesus didn't ask or say things um, that that were willy nilly. He didn't say them just because you know he was bored. Um, but he says, you know, who do, who do men say that I am? And what are the people saying? And Peter's like, ah, some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're like Elijah. Some, you know, he kind of. And and I think Jesus really wanted to get to the heart of Peter. He says, who do you, who do you say I am? 
And he says, well, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And then what Jesus does next is he just says, Peter. He just addresses him by name, you know. And I, I think this generation is longing to just hear, um, to hear Jesus just say their name through all of the, the chaos and through all of the, um, the noise and the clutter. Family dynamics have certainly changed. Mm. Um, kids um, very often have at least one adult that's probably ditched them at some point, whether it's a dad or a mom, you know, it, or in their mind has ditched them. Mm. Um, um, so they're not very trustful. Everything's kind of a kind of surfacey. But the beauty of this, it sounds like a negative expose on this generation, but God does not, He does not set a generation that's not going to be the advancer of the gospel. So I see also in this generation an incredible hunger to like find out their identity, find out who they are. Mm. And I think they've they've been offered kind of this buffet, if you can imagine going to Golden Corral. Um, in a sense, it's like it's been preyed on. Yeah. Identity yeah. crisis. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's... You know, and and I'm not here to clown on Golden Corral because if you want to just go mess yourself up for twenty bucks, that's the place. Um, but you know, if you say, "Hey, hey, Greg, where you know you'll take the missus out for steak tonight," but going to Golden Corral, I mean, I know they got steak out there, but mm-hmm. I'm not, that, that restaurant doesn't come to my first mind. I'm going to, you know, Texas Roadhouse or Longhorn. I'm going to a place that specializes in steak. If you say, "Hey, uh, let's go to a great Italian restaurant." I mean, obviously around here in Chillicothe, I might say Olive Garden or let's go to the spaghetti warehouses back open. Let's go to Buca de Beppo's. Let's you know, hit this new place up in Grove City. Um, but guess what? Golden Corral has, they got pasta too. Golden Corral has everything you could, you could desire. Um, but I think the, the, the scary part is it's kind of like our, um, our entire buffet or menu for these, for these kids is, it's just so much in front of them and they just stare at it. And it's like, I could be this, I could be that. I can, I don't, I don't really know who I am. And there's just, not only that, it's like you look at it and you say, I'm not this and I'm not that. Yeah. It's so good. Spirit of comparison. Oh my gosh. It just can rip anybody apart. I don't care your age. If you're not like real in tune with, yeah. with yourself. Cause we air when we are. compare. Yeah. This, uh, this generation I can't is imagine, hungry, man. You know, the technology kind of started coming up when I was young, but my mom never let us really get into it. I got a Facebook when I was like 15, maybe 16, but even then it wasn't nothing like it is now. Yeah. I mean, I you can like, build a whole whole identity, a whole other life. Man, it's almost like there's more life virtually than Real life, you yeah. know? Like, if you're not tapped into what's going on here, you're under a rock. Yeah. I was thinking about that today, man, and it's like, maybe that's just what it is right now. And yeah. if, if that's where God's going to use me, like, I'm ready to just go full force. Right. And then I picture, like, what happens if it shuts off one day? I picture myself, like, outside of Walmart, <laughs> just doing the same thing, only... Uh, audibly, audibly, you've got the you yeah. got the sandwich board and a sign and a sign, <laughs> and uh, you're still you're still singing though. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. I, I will sit down and eat with you. Cool man. And talk with Jesus. Um, yeah. Uh, since we're on the topic, man, I'm gonna go ahead and hit you with this other one. Okay. What do you What do you believe we as adults can do better to impact the youth? I think the. I think the competition, I think we have to be careful that we don't try to compete in in the world's venues. Um, and, and I think, and this is just, this is just me. Um, and this is not a spirit of, you know, I've got it figured out and other people or other ministries or don't. I think that if we're not careful, we feel like with the digital age, with all of the marketing that's available at your fingertips, um, that that the gospel um, has to be seen through the lens of, of a Taylor Swift concert. And I think there's a time and a place, and I think 
big moments and big venues. I, I have uh, several students that went to a Shabak conference. I think it's an Assemblies of God a conference down in Tennessee, and man, they came back, and a couple of them had been their first time, and they, they were just messed up by the Holy Spirit. They didn't even know what to think, and so I'm not, I'm not saying, and I'm, you know, they had, you know, major singers, and I mean, it was your typical, you know, ten thousand kids, you know, just just jamming out for Jesus, and I think that's important. I think those big moments because, um, I think they need to see that they're not alone in their school. Mm. That. Hey man, we just came for a couple of days in February in Tennessee, and there's like ten thousand kids here worshiping Jesus. Okay, there's there's other kids, you know, that aren't afraid uh, to confess Jesus. Yeah. But I think sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll miss out on the beauty of of the one on one and the investment of time, because that's the one thing that this generation um, doesn't get much of. Because we're talking about all the things that vie for kids' attention, but I know if I'm not careful and I'm at home, I'm on my I'm on Facebook too much. Mm. And so here I am, yeah, I'm watching a movie with my daughter, mm. but I'm not really invested in my daughter because I've got my phone out and I'm either hustling some real estate questions or uh, you know I'm just on Facebook scrolling or I'm checking sports scores or I'm just tied to my phone no differently than somebody that's 35 years younger than me. And I find that if, you know, if I'm not careful, I'm going to miss the one-on-one moments that don't, we're not, we're not guaranteed. And so I think this generation is, Mm. um, it's that mentoring aspect. It's that fill in the gap. It's that, you know, Jesus picked 12 dudes from pretty nondescript circumstances and he changed the whole world. And he said, just follow me and we'll figure this out as we go. And I think it's a matter of just with the, with the youth of today. I think the big moments, the, the the lit services, all of the things are are necessary as a component. But I think sometimes the the small groups, the one on ones, the it's like the valleys. Yeah, when you th- when you it's, say that, that's what I picture. Because you got these big mountain moments. The valleys are just as important too. Yeah, and a lot of our lives are spent. Between the valley and the mountain, yeah, just just flat as this table we're at. We're seeking the mountain, <laughs> yeah, trying to stay on top of the mountain. Oh yeah, because you know who doesn't want to be on top of the mountain, but it's uh, usually not very, very wide at the top. Hmm. So these and these kids know one thing, and and I'm no expert, but you know, 27 years in a classroom through, I mean, when I started teaching, we didn't even have the internet. You know, my first year at East Clinton, they they got Netscape. They had like a computer in this, like the room next door, and it was like dial up modem, mm. that beautiful sound, mm. you know. And like, man, people, I mean, the, the adults were crazier about it than the kids. You know, we're all going over. It's like, man, this is the World Wide Web. I mean, so my teaching career has spanned everything from, you know, nine, the real 9 11. I was a teacher in 01. There was no Facebook, there was no smartphones, there was no social media. You know, one of the most impactful moments of that generation, and you know, there was there was no online conspiracy theories, and you know, all of the things that now are just commonplace. As soon as there's an event, yeah. so it's been dissected, flipped up. It's already been run with whatever particular. These kids, they don't need another voice screaming. They they want time. They want our time. That means more to them than anything because they. It's the one thing that they don't see a lot of adults because we're tied to the... You can't get it on these. Nope. And we're tied, we're, let's be honest, and, and I think being on this podcast is is, is, a, is a good good place to, to kind of be honest. And it's, I mean, I'm on my phone if I'm not careful as much as the same kid I'm yelling at at my house. So Looking yeah. at their screen time, like, how can you be six hours? Up? All of us, man, we'll be in and the it, same room, just silent. Everybody on their own little journey. Yep. Little, little journey, we might as well be in four different states. And I think we're probably in four different state of minds sometime. Oh, that's good. Just sitting in a room and, you know, got a kid could be struggling with his literal faith in the existence of Jesus. I wouldn't know it because I'm scrolling Facebook. We've been thinking about hurting them, so. Yeah. <sighs> and, uh, and these kids crave... Uh, which has made teaching challenging because you, you you might have half of your, you know, my 125 students during the day, you know, you might have 50 or 60 that crave that 
just just that personal interaction. It's, that's a lot. That number's just gone up over the years. Mm. I mean, you always would say you had the needy kid back in the day, you know, just you knew they were probably from some tough circumstances and they'd kind of hang at your desk. The desk lizard, you know, kind of always be up there. And now it's, you know. Everybody. If you sit at your desk, probably 15 kids out of a class of 25 will come up. And just, you know, hey, Mr. P, what's up? You know, what's going on? Oh, not much. I'm just, you know, you done with your work? I'll get to it. Hey, you think the Pirates are going to be good this year? Uh, they're never good. But Small talking. You know, they just, they may not even know where to go with it, but they just, they need just, it. they need it. And you taking that time out, even though they may not be able to articulate it at that moment at 14, 15, 16, 17, they come back later and go, man, that was, I appreciate you. Just, you know, I was yeah, an idiot man. when I was 16. Didn't know it. I said, well, we all were, but. You know they 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 crave that that one on one, and I think sometimes in the in the the big shows that we will sometimes want to put on to to promote the gospel. Sometimes we just miss the the the, the at our own home moments. You know, one of your kids brings a friend over, and we've lost the dinner table. Yeah, you know, we're just hey, how was your day? How was your day today, Dre? Did you really have a good day? You're like, eh, it's kind of crappy. Well, that sucks. Why was it crappy? I mean, we're having a podcast to do what families should be doing all over, all over this country with the gospel, and that's just, mm. just living life around a table, with no, no distractions. We've already had both of our phones have already vibrated and buzzed, mm-hmm. and I mean, it's just normal. I'm over here hitting my watch, trying to, you know, hope it doesn't bleed through on the podcast. I'm over here cracking my smart watch and try to <laughs> shut up the vibrations and. Man, we're, I think we just we've lost the the dinner table moments. These kids desperately want that. <laughs> well, I have a question for you. Yeah, man, I know I needed I needed to hear that. Uh, man. Well, I think yeah, it's a it's a gut check for all of us. I know for sure for me. A lot of times, whenever I, you know, just have these conversations, there's so much for me to chew on. I don't conversate a lot. You know, more than a surface level conversation. Right. And I haven't for years. So it's new to me, man. A lot of times people ask me a question and it's like, you see me process it real time because not a lot of that happens. Well, and this generation struggles a little bit with the the one-on-one. You know, they're great with their thumbs. I mean, most of focused externally. Yeah. There's not a lot pushing us to go inwardly, you know. And if you haven't, you know, worked through the trials of life, you don't want to go inwardly. You know, when I was young, I think that's what fueled my addiction, man. Kept me from going inside of myself. But um, now I, I, I find so much, bro. When the word says the kingdom of heaven is within, like even today, whenever I started... <laughs> You know, I got on that stupid app, and it's like I became aware, like, oh, man, here comes this beast rising up in me. Let me just get up out of here. I took off. I went to my nature spot, and it's in that spot that, like, I go inside myself. There's nothing stimulating me to focus externally. I walk with God, man, and yeah, it's a beautiful place. Uh, I find direction. That's why I came up with all your questions today. Um. Just so many things creatively have spawned from going inside of myself. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, if you think about from the inside out, we know that, you know, even, even the concept of holiness is misunderstood. We, we often, you know, can define holiness as looking a certain way. Holiness is, is a condition of the heart that radiates outward. It'll be things like vaping eventually becomes a, a conviction of the Holy Spirit, not because the Holy Spirit is upset because you particularly look bad, or you, it's because in that moment you're ready to handle that instruction and that that kind of rebuke. Um, but but that's an internal. That's you being willing to go inside, let the Holy Spirit do a work, and eventually it comes out and it, and it manifests outwardly. The things we see outwardly 
are often, maybe even you get old like me, decades of something internal. Hmm. And, and people are like, oh, that's awesome. Look, you've got a, you know, you've got a, a really great ministry or a really great family or a really great marriage. And you think, yeah, you don't know all the times we about quit. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I, I heard it explained one time that, you know, when, when God creates anything, when he created the earth as we know it, when, you know, you read all of through Genesis, if he's a spirit, and we know, you know, it says God is a spirit. Mm-hmm. No, spirit has no form. It just is everywhere. I don't think his spirit l- just stops existing somewhere. I don't think his spirit just has imaginary line in space that ju- oh, I don't go past this line. If we believe that he created it all, then he can only create out of himself. He can't create anything externally and bring it inside. Mm because he is everywhere. He fills every corner. He said, the earth is my footstool. I recline in the heavens. And so when he created you and me, when he created um, planets and the things that we can visually see because we think we're really cool as humans and we've got the you know, outer space figured out, we've got God's creation finally figured out because we know DNA and we can split the atom and all the things we think we've, you know, we've, we're helping God out with. Um, he doesn't create anything that's not already from the inside. So when he creates, when he created you, Dre, when he created me, that came from out of him. Mm. Let us make man in our image. You know, he he breathed into man the breath of life. And then he became in, out. And those deep moments are so vital. But we almost have to schedule them in our world today, because you almost have to be like, "Well, I've got to, yeah. you know, I'm gonna get a little sideways. I better, I better book my quiet time." I hate that. If I'm being honest, I hate to have to put it on my to do list because I forget. I shouldn't forget to go be one with Him. Mm-hmm. But here I am. There's so many distractions. You know, we face, and then the the pool that life uh, has on us, requires of us, just to sustain our existence. Yeah. I think it's honorable. I think it is. To have a heart to even want to schedule quiet time with God. Yeah. Sucks that it's that way, but. Nope. I, uh, my, uh, my pastor, uh, Aaron. Heinz had a best illustration I've ever heard. And, you know, he's he's been married a few years longer than, than my wife and I. And he said, listen, if I only scheduled and booked time with my wife, um, I wouldn't be married. Hmm. But if I only lived <clears throat> in this idea of spontaneity, I wouldn't be married. You know, it's a balance of we got to set a date night. We haven't gone out for a while, so we book we book it on the calendar. But then there are spontaneous moments that just just happen, yeah. and it's a mixture of both. Don't don't try to you know you might lean more toward one or the other as a personality, but you know if I only told Crystal, you only get me if you you got to put it on the calendar. Okay, <laughs> I mean she's you know yeah that would not go well. That would not go well. Um, yeah. She'd be like, excuse me? Yeah. Babe, you got to book it. If you want it, you got to book it. You know, this whole package is, you know, it's lots of people want to hang out with me, you know. Lots of, uh, you know, I got two full-time jobs and a ministry, and I mean, you got to put it on the calendar. I'm going to forget. Yeah, that, and I think our relationship with Jesus is that same way. There's, I mean, I put on, I mean, right now, if you look at tomorrow, I've got prayer walk as, as the first checkbox. I'm not going to forget to do my prayer walk. It's just consistent, but it's on there to just keep me true and honorable to set my day right. Mm. Um, but then there's just moments I'll be driving in a car and just a song will pop up or I'll just catch a song in my head. I put it on, man. I just start weeping. Yeah. It's just spontaneous. He just reminds me that he's he's my dad and that he's 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 never going to love me more or less in, in this moment. No matter what I do, he's he's not giving up on me. 
And I just sometimes I just need to hear that, especially with my earthly father having been gone for for a while. I just sometimes, you know, so spontaneous and and you know, and then booking that time, both are necessary. So good for you. For, Same to you, for, man. For, for knowing when to slip off to your 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 nature spot. Yeah. Because you do, man. If I don't. If there's one thing we're, we've we been told to run from, it's that. Flee. Don't try to fight it. Nope. Don't try to stay in it. Oh. You better yeah. get up out of here. We have <laughs> all goofed up trying to just sit on it, right? Oops. Like, I'm just going to, you know, it's just a. Get consumed. Oh, it, it's, like a, it's like a cancer, man. It's just. Mm. It's like stage one to fives instantly. He says, "You better, yeah, you better flee from that." Usain Bolt, that puppy. Yeah. It's like okay. All right, I got one for you. Whew. I don't know how long. How long is this podcast supposed to go? Uh, we're at forty-seven minutes. All right. Uh, we'll see. Okay, we'll see. Sometimes we don't get through all the questions. That's that's cool. Uh, what do you see when you look in the mirror? I'm assuming in the morning, but you know, just randomly, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Um, I see a work, man. I see a work of God. You know, I know what you're referring to. A lot of times, I don't like. It's not a daily reflection. Sure. When I think of myself and just everything that's happening around me, everything that's happened through me. It's like it all reverts back to that moment, man, when Christ came into my life. It's all spiraled from that. When you boil me down to, like, who I am, I'm still the same dirt ball. But uh, Christ has done a work in me, continues to do a work in me, shaping and molding me. So I see a, I see an art. Yes. I love that. Sometimes I just see a wrinkle where there wasn't a wrinkle before. Yeah. And I go, oh, who's that old guy? But getting old is uh, different, man. It's like when you're on your 20s, it seems like a fairy tale. Yeah. Something happened when I turned 30. It, it all of a sudden got harder to get off the ground. It's funny. You'd think a 24-hour period of that that simple transition would, wouldn't really be a thing. And uh, uh, it, it's a thing. Yeah. Try to sneak up on my son. It's probably been a couple of years ago. He he is uh, much like myself and my, my mom. He's not much of a sleeper. And uh, he'd get up, you know, even when he's 17 now, but his most of his life he'd get up and just bake a cake at 3 in the morning. Hmm. Cause he wouldn't even eat the cake. Didn't even like the cake. Just bored. <laughs> His brain never stops. It's a gift and a curse, I guess. But yep. And so I try to sneak down the hall because if he woke us up, I'd get pretty mad at him because, like, you know, I don't sleep a lot, but when I sleep, I need to sleep. Like sleeps, God did. God put that in us that rest to recharge. So I'd come sneaking down the hall into the kitchen, and he'd call me Rice Krispie Treats. He's like, Dad, you snap, crackle, pop with all them ankles and knees. He's like, you can't sneak <laughs> up on nobody. <laughs> he said, first That's I thought, funny. man, that, that new floor we put down was something they didn't do a good job. But he's like, that's your ankles. <laughs> and I was just, I just had to own it because I could hear it. <laughs> yeah. Like, it doesn't hurt. It just, maybe, I'm, maybe I need to drink more water. but Stretch or something. But man, well, you know, trying to catch a kid baking a cake, yell at him, send him back to bed. Yeah, just, I ain't got time to stretch. Yeah, he just, I'd be halfway down the hall. Hey, Dad, how did you know? Snap, crackle, pop. I'm like, man, that's, 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 that's horrible. Funny. But uh, at least at least I'm still at the point in my life where the snap, crackle, pop doesn't hurt. I know that's coming later, you know, when you still snap, crackle, pop. But, you know, then you go, oh. So. My next question for okay. you is, what do you fear? What do I fear? Yeah, do you fear anything right now? I'm going to give you one one that's kind of a spiritual fear, a scripture that haunts me. Um, and then, so it'll kind of be a two, kind of a two-part answer because I don't know if I can parse them out. Maybe they're connected. Maybe you can help me connect them. Um, the one scripturally is, is where Jesus is talking about that there will be people 
the de- judgment day that will come yeah. up to him and say, in, in your name, right? I mean, they knew the name, the name right. of Jesus. Man, I pretty much straight up had church. Man, I cast out demons. I laid hands on the sick, and they recovered. And Jesus said in that day, I'm going to look at him and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I did not know you. And that's always been a, a probably a healthy fear, mm-hmm. a scripture that that has kind of always kind of stuck under my skin, that to do all things in love when I catch myself, especially when I was a little bit younger, you know, you're all, you've got the energy to match, but you don't necessarily have the wisdom or the time in the gospel. So you're, you're just running on raw emotion sometimes. And growing up Pentecostal, that was pretty normal. It's just raw emotion. Um, I heard and, a guy say, in reference to that scripture that like, you know, here, here Jesus was, or these people came to Jesus with a list of things that they did. Yeah. A list of reasons why they deserve to get into heaven. Yeah. When in reality, it's like, we don't, we don't deserve. And when we come to Christ was like, it's because of what you did. Yeah. It did. Like, my and faith only was in what you. you did. So here you got a group of people who it's evident that their faith was in the things that they were doing and not in the work that Christ had done. And if they really knew Christ, if they had a relationship with Christ, they would know. Yeah. It's nothing that I've done. Not at all. It's and everything th- that he did. I think it's the part where he says, I, I did I don't know you. That's the scary part that we can operate in even like gifts of the feel, spirit. Have you ever felt like, you know, and who knows, maybe they did it. Maybe they wasn't operating in gifts of the spirit. Yeah. You know, anybody can wield around a name, but yeah. if you don't know Christ. Well, I mean, we know the the sons of Sceva. I cannot I cannot imagine Jesus telling me he never knew me. No, I like there ain't no way. Because he came to me. He sought you out. He did. <laughs> it and first of all, I think scripturally we, we know that he knows everybody anyway. Right. But I think that word know there is more like the intimate, you know. I'm sure if we pull that up in Greek. It's almost like to know your wife or like yeah. to, to know your children, you know, to have that kind of deep relationship. But yeah, how could you not even know me? Like, I mean, we see it in the Sons of Sceva where they're running around trying to like, you know, use, they, they've watched Paul kind of walk through the town and lay hands on people and they run around and the demons come out of the guy and they say like, Jesus, we know, Paul, we know, who the heck are you? And they just they said they beat these dudes, beat them up, buck naked, and threw them out in the street. It's like even the devil knows like the name. And he knows who's operating, not just in the name, but in relationship. And uh, so that's kind of spiritually always been a healthy fear to just make yeah. sure that that I'm not so into a ministry or so into a, a thing. Mm-hmm. That the thing becomes more than him. Yeah. Not that I feel like ever in a moment, like an idol, that he's not going to know me, but that in this particular adventure or venture, that I might lose sight of, of, of him. My, you know, the, the fear that I, I grapple with to this day is. Dre, there's probably not a more boring human being you're ever going to have on this podcast. I promise you that. I mean, the the places that God is is open for me is it's it's really almost hilarious sometimes. Like, you know, it's like, oh, who's going to take over the Keys to Success program and like get up in front of kids and like let them tell their stories? And bro, I ain't even had to drink alcohol in my life. I never smoked a cigarette. I'm a, that doesn't make you lame, but mm-hmm. not, like, you know, I, it's like, you know, God wants you to use somebody that's like been in it, been out of it, and he does. Mm-hmm. But it's like, why you got me out here? Like, I almost feel like a fraud. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't even present it. What I do present is that my dad, you know, kind of his life and that my dad was that uh, cycle breaker. Jesus came in, did a work in his life, and so mm-hmm. the cycles of the sins of his father and his grandfather, who were womanizers, abusers, alcoholics, you know, my dad was taken away from from his mom and dad, from his mom when he was five, 
uh, horribly abused as a child, um, you know, and then begin to wrestle some of those same demons as he, you know, kind of progressed through adolescence until he ran into Jesus, until Jesus came and found him yeah. and knew him. And then we got to grow up with the best dad in the world. You know, and I and that was that was the story I really told was I'm not gonna sit up here and try to come up with some kind of like, yeah, bro, I did cocaine for 52 years. Like I just, I, I you know, they actually made the movie uh, with Al Pacino, man, about me. I used to just eat it with a spoon. Like, you know, you can't fool kids that like have grown up in it. Like they could sniff a fraud. First of all, kids could sniff a fraud 100 miles away <laughs> anyway. So that's my that was my one story, and it, you know, this, you know. This persona that I always seem to gravitate toward was that people seemed to want to hang out with me and talk. They liked me. Um, and I just, I never had trauma. That I mean, I was very blessed growing up. I mean, does it, everything wasn't perfect, but I, I was a very... We almost feel guilty because it's like, man, I should have, I should have run, run around on my wife five times, or man, I should have gotten a bar fight or been arrested a couple times. I, you know, that would get a couple teardrop tats. You know, maybe I'd help my, my street image. Street cred. Yeah, I guess some street cred. I mean, I mean, I'm known at school as G Money, but, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, the only bands I got are uh, Diet Do in my fridge in my classroom, and. Uh, you know, it's just I'm just so lame when it comes to that because it's like I got no street cred at all, and I hear I am at Chogade High School for 27 years, and until a couple of years ago, when you know, when all this law enforcement shows up at my house, kicking the front door in, and I don't even know why they're at my house, and I'm like, I remember, probably didn't help they used the the wrong name at first, um, you know, I had a neighbor. He's he's not not in the neighborhood anymore. He, I think he enjoyed the uh, Willie Nelson Snoop Dogg life a little bit. It's just fine, whatever. He's a real chill, dude. Real chill, dude. I thought, oh, they got the wrong house. I mean, he maybe he's doing a little more than just personal enjoyment. You know, you might want to head over there. No, they're they're here to yell at you. They're here to search your house. They're here because, uh, because they think you did something. And for the first time in my life, because, you know, people are more than glad to write articles real quick and, you know, throw that out there. Mm. And for the first time in my life, like, people thought something differently of me that I had taken pride in. Not that I was good enough to never smoke or drink. I just didn't grow up around it. It was an easy decision for me. I mean, could you imagine me, Dre? People are like, oh, alcohol's liquid courage. It'll loosen you up. Dude, dude, what about me thinks I need loosened up at a party? Like, the only two things if I get drunk is I'm going to be the guy that sits in a corner and cries all night, or I'm just throwing punches at everybody until somebody knocks me out. Like, I just, it just never appealed to me. And so, like, I felt like I didn't have to battle trauma and demons from addiction and those kind of things. I could operate pretty freely on multiple levels of people's broken because I didn't really have a story of brokenness. And so it was easy for me to climb these rungs of these, this kind of this ladder of, man, I was friends with everybody from, from drug dealers to gang bangers to, you know, the best kids that are brain surgeons now. Like I just, you know, everybody seemed to like Chili for Philly. It's just a cool dude. Never thought I was the best teacher. Never thought I was the best preacher. I just, I just love people, man. I just, I like, I judge you. Like, I just love you. And all of a sudden, boom, there's an article. And the article says, man, you might have done this. And it links it to a name, and it's just SVU. And you're like, what? And for the first time in my life, I didn't know what to do with myself. And my, my greatest fear, I think I, I realized in that moment, was I can't be good enough. I can't, I can't not do enough unbad things or not do bad things um, to make people like love me or accept me. I was just, and that's what my wife was referring to and I said earlier about like she's just, you know, she's in my face. Like first 25 years of our marriage, never lived in fear. I'm going to be softball coach. 
I never coached softball a day in my life. I just knew our team sucked at Chilcotty High School, and I could do better. <laughs> now, the principal called me in for three separate interviews. Turned out I was the only one that applied. Who calls you in for three separate interviews? That's because they're trying to take more time calling all these other coaches yeah. in the area. Like, hey, seriously, sure the only dude this. that applied is a dude that's never even coached Little League. But I was like, I don't care. I can do it. I can do all things through Christ. Yeah. Like, and man, we had, I, I had kids come to Christ. Like start their Christian walk just because of the, just because like I wasn't afraid to just be me. Let the gospel radiate. It's kind of what you said when when you you know you came to film that. Here comes this kind of goofy dude just popping out the house. Yeah, way too old to be goofy. Like this guy's in his <laughs> like late forties. Like chill, bro. <laughs> and I just was that guy until one day, literally in a moment, I wasn't. Mm. And my fear, my greatest fear, I didn't even know it. Was that people would think bad bad of me? Yeah, and I don't know that I've completely recovered. Um, you know, obviously nothing nothing came of it because um, well, internet's a crazy place. So that's what it was. People was making allegations. Yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't even allegations. It was it was that I'd created like some some. Uh, fake text messages and stuff and like sent them to people or whatever, but they were actually sent to me and I opened them kind of thing. Like just, and that's what created like an IP hit. And I, I couldn't understand like, God, why would, like, why would you let this happen to me? Cause you don't recover from that. I guess that, that you know, if you're a teacher or a preacher, that's, like I said, that's a, that's a death now. It's the one. It's the one thing you don't recover from, and I just couldn't. I couldn't understand like why this was happening because I didn't do anything. I kept. I remember just sitting. I wasn't really yelling at the officers, but I just kept saying, "Why are you here?" Like literally, they they told me to stop saying that because it had been like eighteen straight minutes of me saying, "Why are you here? Why are you here? Why?" Are you? And they're like, "You can stop saying that now. We're here because we're allowed to be here." Because I didn't, I mean, I'm thinking like, and in that moment, man, my greatest fear was realized that people would think something of me that wasn't true until you realize you can't control that. Mm. And all of a sudden, all the trauma I'd never lived with, all of the baggage I never had, all of the, the growing up with a mom and a dad that were happily married, that took us to church. I mean, it was like the poster you know, picture perfect life that you would, you're supposed to raise your kids in the truth. Like I was raised in the truth of the gospel of Jesus. I was like, I went to college, I got married. I never cheated on my wife. Like it almost sounds like a list of things you'd be proud of, right? Mm -hmm. Like cocky until you, until you can't control your image. You can't control everything. And all of a sudden I had to realize that Man, my only hope, my only, my only identity is in Jesus Christ alone. And I'm like, I don't know how, on how you put the pieces of, of my life back together. But that fourth thing that I prayed, that I started this podcast off with, was Jesus, someday, man, let me be able to tell my story for your glory. And I don't know. I don't know who's going to offer me that chance. I don't know how that's ever going to happen. But, man, I've been down a dark road where I just, and we're ashamed of those dark roads. Yeah. We, we think that they're, they're a burden. It's the testimony he's talking about. And now, okay, that this, I mean, we, we, you better have a three-hour podcast tonight. Is it ever like, maybe, I, I'm, I'm sure you've picked up on it. It took me, because you're smarter than I am, it took me probably into my mid-30s before I figured it out. But when Judas comes in the garden uh, with, with the soldiers to, to sell, you know, to betray Jesus, and Jesus looks up at him and he says, Judas, my friend. I don't know what kind of f friend requirements Jesus has, um, that would not be on my, my list of, of what I would call you 
as a friend as mm-hmm. if you sold me literally for like 30 pieces of silver. But without Judas, there's no cross. And, and I think in the moments that if we really understand suffering, if we really understand the trials, and the betrayals, you know, you and I aren't saved if Jesus doesn't die on a cross. But to get to that point, I mean, he's praying in the garden, let this cup pass for me. He don't yeah. want to do it. And God uses a guy named Judas to sell him out, and somehow Jesus has the, the, the wherewithal to call him a friend. And, and, and I can look back like two years ago and say, that situation about kill me, I could call it a friend because it's made me stronger in Christ. It's, it's galvanized my prayer life. I've grown from it. Mm. If I could, now, listen, if I could erase it, 100%. Yeah. Because like... That's kind of the way it is with, you know, all the negative experiences I've had. I can look back and consider everything a blessing because I can use it now. He, he, he uses it. Yeah. He uses my mess to... Glorify his name. Yeah. And if I can do that, man, I had a kind of like a little revelation last night, just of a mentality shift. You know, we hear of all this crazy chaos going on in the world, man. And it's nothing new. Like I can remember my mind went back to 2012 when they're talking about like, you know, all this stuff, destruction and end of the world as we know it. And back then I would want to prepare I got to prepare to survive. All right, yeah. And uh, matter of fact, I was on the on the day of 2012. Uh, I was ready to park my car in front of Dunham's, and if our phones quit working, I was going to drive my car through the doors. And, oh, you were ready. And start taking guns and everything. Look at you, man. You're like a survivalist. And I'm telling everybody work. I'm like, you know, I'm preparing for this moment. So uh, it's like now, <laughs> man. Whenever I hear of all this stuff, I hear of you know the wars, the rumors of wars, death and destruction, into the world as we know it. I've noticed that my mentality instantly shifts to like, man, there's not a lot of time left. And if you can use me to save somebody, just let it be done. My hope is no longer in a life here on earth. No. Or a good life or a long life. It's more like I just want to, whatever purpose God has for me, I want to fulfill that. And that comes from the understanding that Life continues. <laughs> yeah, I'm just passing through here, and we're just we're just pilgrims. We're just we're just kind of on a journey. It, you know, he's an eternal God, so everything he does is based off of eternity, which is not time. I mean, he even says in his word that he created time for us to mark the seasons. Created time. It's the God we serve that he literally invented it. The, the thing that none of us get around. We watch our. Our phones, you know, that's all the time is. I keep checking your, because your screen don't go off. So I keep, you know, when I talk for too long, I look over and it tells me what time <laughs> it is. You know, every everything is is based on time, right? Yeah. You know, we gotta do this. And, you know, this is a God who who is eternal. Everything He does is based on eternity with Him, and we get so twisted because we spent two years in a really hard place. Or man, it's been a long week at work, and we're about to just quit our job, mm-hmm. and that's normal. But it's like he'll make decisions of what comes into your life and what happens to you. He'll move you to another state, a new job, just for that one person that's been putting their head on a pillow at night crying. God send me somebody. If you're really real, send me somebody to a job that'll just tell me about a God a higher being, wherever they're at in kind of that that movement forward. And yeah, God will uproot your whole family, send you to a whole new job and a whole new state to reach one person. Mm. Because he's thinking of eternity. Yeah. We're mad because, you know, we lost our our six years seniority at the at the plant. And he's like, six years? Really? Six years? That's what you're that's what you're stuck on? How about eternity? Yeah with me in paradise and that there'll be people there that can point to my goodness and my grace and my glory. But yet you got to play a part in bringing them to the foot of the cross where I could, where I could meet them. 
And it's like, wait, you, you, you know, it's in Ephesians where he says, man, he, it pleased him to bring us into his family. What? You want Dre and me and your family? Uh, we're probably going to mess things up a lot. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it pleases me to bring you into my family. By the spirit of adoption, we get to cry, I have a father. Man, yeah. And I, I get to be a part of that. Yeah. And I get twisted up on four hours or a month. And I know I'm, I'm bound by 20 time. 20 minutes, man. Oh, somebody, 20 minutes. And I'm, I'm, somebody wastes your time for an hour sometimes. I'm on Bridge Street, man. I'm ready to literally just just sell out my entire religious philosophy because I'm stuck, <laughs> stuck at that stupid light by BP that always it knows my car. <laughs> Fed's got it tapped or something because I, I can't get through that light. Like it could turn green. I'm one car back and it'll turn red on me again. And, you know, and I got a, what's that, three minutes? I don't even think the light takes that long, really. Yeah, it don't. But man, I'm ready to, like, I've probably said some things right at that light. I've counted. It's like 20 seconds. Yeah, okay. I but, count. I, when I set it lights, I count them down. Do you? Yeah. Especially if I'm on the front line. Oh, okay. <laughs> so like, you just like, what's what this? if this person wants to race? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you've got a. You've got a car. I generally drive like a uh, hybrid Camry or a Subaru <laughs> or a Prius. So there's nobody, nobody really revving it up there. But uh, yeah, but I'm ready to literally sell out because 20 seconds. Sometimes we just we can't get out of our own way. Yeah, it's really our focus too, man. Because it's like if you think if your mind is focused on on God and the things of the Spirit, there's always something that we can do. No matter what we're doing or where we're at, sitting at that light, man. Maybe who, I should pray who, for the people working right. at BP. Who could you pray for? Prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Yep, they bring much power. But and and that's that battle with the flesh. That's one of the things. Yeah, I it's wrote crazy. Down. You know, Paul How, says uh, quickly we can lose oh. our our walk in the spirit. Somebody commented on one of my videos yesterday, man. I made a video. And uh, I started off with like, have you ever heard a father and a son sing about Jesus? Uh-uh. That's how my video started. And okay. this lady commented and she said, have you ever heard of a toothbrush and toothpaste? <laughs> right off the rip. And huh? I was like, that was mean. Man, and, uh, come on, Karen. So it's like, I didn't even notice it. But at the time, man, like I'm looking through her Facebook and I'm thinking all this stuff that I can uh-huh. say. It says that she works at Mind Your Own Business. Oh, I was okay. Like, I'm about to and be like, well, you better you better find a new job because it's about to replace you. You ain't doing a good job over there. Uh, and and it just hit me. I was like, man, there's there's like thousands of people that had good things to say about this video. But we'll lock Why in am that. I about to give my energy to this one person who says something negative? It's so good, Dre. Whenever I could have gave my energy to all these people who, and so it's like it. It took me on this journey, man. The Lord was working with me. And what it boiled down to was like she threatened my image. That's, and God had to like yep. remind me that this ain't about you. This ain't about you. Matter of fact, it's about her. That's the one that you need to pray for. Yep. And I was like, wow. And it was in a moment. It was like I saw how you can either view things with carnal eyes or view them spiritually. Carnally, I was offended, angry, angry and upset but spiritually the enemy exposed himself yeah because here you got all these people who didn't have nothing bad to say but for somebody to do take time out of their day and attack my character for no reason man they're bound inside by something dark something dark is is got them held in captivity stopping them from seeing joy stopping them from being kind stopping them from feeling peace so good. And so it's like I saw that in a moment. I started praying against it for her because the same peace that's for me is for her. The same joy that's for me yes, sir. is for her. And it, you know, but it just opened my eyes to like, wow, how do I, how do I get so numb to the spirit? Yeah. That I even open myself up for an ability to be offended for something like that. Yeah. And how do I walk? How do I walk constantly in the spirit? Ready for battle. Yeah. No, that's exactly what I was talking about is, you know, I was not prepared. Uh, you know, I was not prepared when my image got dirtied up. I can't imagine, man. I just, I wasn't ready. But I, you know, the, the best thing I, I did was, you know, and, and when I say the best thing I did was really, 
was really something I didn't do. You know, I could have, I, I, I remember telling, um, telling my wife, like, I'll go on Channel 4 right now. I'll go on Oprah, call her up. Like, I didn't do nothing wrong. Like, I got nothing to hide. You know, I was ready to, you know, she just kind of patted me on the head. We, we might want to, our whole world just got flipped upside down. We might want to just take a breath. I'm like, I'm going to go right out here in the street, man, in my sweatpants, and just holler. And, man, I could have got on Facebook and attacked every single one of those. You know, at some point I went back and looked at the memes and read all the, the comments. Mm. And, you know, I felt like in a weird way it was it was kind of therapy because um, I wanted to see if, if that same spirit was back of a fence. Like, you know, because when I first saw some of those things, man, it's like, I saw some people comment, and I knew some trash about them, right? You know, yeah. It's like, right? You what? Like, but man, the silly games we play that get us off mission. It's that quarter inch, yeah, yeah, off, off, off level. And man, and I, and I spent way too much time being off level. But it was the best thing God kept me from was getting on Facebook. Just you know, at that point, I just had to remember something my pastor said, and he said, "Listen." A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And while we use that scripture a lot for naming babies, um, the, the depth of that scripture is a good name is really a reputation. And he's like, I promise you, like your reputation, who you are in Christ always wins out. Always. You may not see it right now, but who you are in Christ what he knows you to be. Mm-hmm. And it's like, man, if I could just tell people one thing, it's like wherever you're at right now, wherever you're struggling, wherever you feel real vulnerable, wherever you keep messing up, you're still Christ's. And that doesn't define you. At some point, that'll be your Judas, and you'll look back and say, that's my friend, because it made me. It made me get closer to Jesus. Mm-hmm. It finally made me bow a knee at the cross. It finally propelled me to my destiny. For Jesus, that was the cross. And so um, we just don't suffer well. So we started off this whole podcast, you know, and what, what, what's God doing in your life? What, where are you at? It's like, man, we, we don't understand the beauty and the joy of going through tribulations and hard times, hmm. the, the, how the Spirit so shines through us if we'll just sit in it and let His name be glorified. But, man, we're, we're so quick to start trying to buff up our image. Yeah. Because it's that spirit of offense. How's that Karen going to come on there and talk about draining the toothbrush? And the, I mean. Fun okay. fact, I haven't used toothpaste for six years. Okay. Well, <laughs> teeth look good, man. Hey, man, I did drugs for 14 years. I'm blessed to have teeth. <laughs> man, bro, you just dropping it like that. Boom. Hey, Boom. I'll tell you what, bro. When I stopped using toothpaste, my teeth quit hurting. That's, that's awesome. And so it's like, yeah, they might be a little stained up. but They look good to me, man. They're still in there. I mean, I was getting them pulled out left and right. And I was like, you know what? Just See, now I can't help but stare at your teeth. Part. See, now I'm just like locked in on your teeth. <laughs> just like, man, he's, that's a beautiful teeth. I haven't teeth. put soap on my body for six years either. Man, okay. <laughs> Giving them all the jewels. Yeah, man, you just, it's like Dre uncut tonight. Yeah, I went through uh, this crazy spiritual awakening, man. That's what started this whole journey, and it was like, I thought maybe that was part of that 2012 survivalist uh, <clears throat> kick. Well, was, you know, you ain't going to have soap. When you're driving your car to the front of Donald's. I started researching Dottoms. all this stuff that's in the soap. And it's like, man, these showers are like modern-day gas chambers. All this stuff goes airborne, and we're breathing it into our body. Soap is vicious, man. If you watch how it flows through water, it's vicious. And for that to get into our body, I just quit using it. Whenever I went, I went vegan for three years. I didn't use deodorant. I didn't stink. It's like I realized... You know, whenever we start to stink, that's how our body's saying, hey, that stuff that you're putting in me is trash. You smell that? <laughs> you smell like trash. Well, we say you got the, you got the, uh, the you ever meat, smell the meat the rotten sweats. melon? <laughs> yeah, you got the meat sweats or something. You're yeah. putting that, that like uh, processed meat in you or something. Yeah. You know. a rotten melon really doesn't stink. Funny thing is, I, mean, I still you, grab you smell a, a rotten cow for miles, man. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah catch, catch a nice I ride. I use deodorant now because my diet is terrible. And I stink. <laughs> and if I talk, use it. <laughs> you're like, I am eating too much sweets. Yeah, but, that's yeah. that's awesome. It's good old fashioned water and a scrub, man. It's kept me clean. Kept you clean. Ain't well, nobody you ever know. said nothing different about me. I mean, uh, you'd never I've, know unless you knew. 
I don't know. Now I don't you know, know. City difference. Hey, <laughs> uh, I do use uh, Old Spice. Uh, yeah, I got some Versace on my shirt. I smell nice. <laughs> I can't smell that well uh, right at the moment. So. <laughs> I, heard, I heard the attempt. Denied. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, a little, little jammed up there. Um, Man, that's good stuff. We've been at it for an hour and twenty-two. Yeah, we have. I think we're probably approaching a good, good ending point. Good jump off place. You got any any final remarks? Anything you want to get off the chest? Ooh. Any advice? Somebody who might be listening. Second Corinthians uh, four, and uh, just you know, the worst thing you can tell somebody is when they're going through hell is to hit them with Second Corinthians chapter four. They will, they might punch you. I don't care if it's if it's like your your best friend. Because as soon as you started out with, for these light momentary afflictions, are but uh, just 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 they're just momentary. Man, somebody who's going through it might swing on you. Because in that moment, it's the worst thing you've ever been through. Yeah. But but Paul writes, and he says that, you know, it's preparing us for that eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And many are the afflictions of the righteous, hmm. but God brings us out of them. Like, that's his story that he's growing in all of us. The, the afflictions aren't going away, but I think for us to look at any affliction we go through and to, I'm, I'm a big proponent of like, you know, I'm a teacher and I'm old school, so I'm old three by five index cards, you know. Make it your screensaver if you're if you're a techie. Man, put that, man, this is just a light momentary affliction. You know, I think some people sum up, this too shall pass. But it's deeper than that. Yeah. Man, it is helping prepare us. So so he's gonna take affliction to prepare us for eternal weight of glory beyond comparison, mm. you'd think not suffering on earth would help prepare us for not suffering in heaven. Yeah. I mean, right? Like, if, if I'm never going to suffer in heaven and there's no tears and there's no broken hearts and there's no sickness and there's no death, I, I'm ready to start that trial run right now. Where do I sign up for the, for the next 25 year? Greg doesn't go through any hardship pack. You know, is that, is that, you know, 99.99 on Klarna, you know, you're going to take that out 14.99 a month. What, you know, I'll sign up for that. No, he says, I'm going to use the afflictions that will come your way to prepare your heart. It's crazy to think about. I watched a video yesterday. This guy was saying all kinds of stuff, man. He was saying all kinds of stuff. Blew my mind. And he was like putting it together through the Bible. And pretty much uh, just the part I'm thinking of, he made me think about was like, he said that Adam and Eve didn't know what a lie was. He said, whenever we are back in a glorified body, like our discernment is going to be unreal because of everything that we experienced here on earth. Wow. The afflictions. Yeah. Of yeah. good and evil. Yeah. Or, well, evil. <laughs> really. Yeah, really. That's, that's it. That's crazy, man. It's we we have no idea. Right we have no. That's that's a stake right there. We have no idea. At times, it's just, just hope, not, hope and trust. Yeah, it's all yeah. working out for for his good. Yeah. You know, and it's in those moments when you know when you're weak, the admission that you're weak is when you're made strong. You know, I remember this might have been kind of at the some point in your childhood. Remember the whole no fear clothing line? It was I don't know if it kind of generated with skateboards. And, mm -hmm. yeah. But it was like no fear. And people put it on decals on their cars and and it's like if you you know, if you gotta tell me no fear, I don't know. My dad used to always say, if you gotta put up drug free zone signs it probably ain't a drug-free zone. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you can advertise it, but there's a reason you're advertising it because the problem exists there. Yeah. You know, no fear, no fear, right? It's just this whole idea. Of saying, we ain't scared of nothing. It's like, man, we can we can get so bogged down by that spirit of fear, and it it will dress itself up. We use words like cool, cool, acceptable words like anxiety. Yeah. Anxious. I'm a little skittish. And, and they're kind of code words that we've softened a little bit. But if it's anything that is not love, power, and a sound mind, the Bible's really clear on where that comes from, a spirit of fear. And uh, afflictions, trials, tribulations are not a sign that you're, that you're out of balance in your walk with Jesus. Man, he's doing a work in you. That greatest praise is to be able to just stand there where there's no good reason to praise it. Because, man, you just got the phone call you didn't want. You just got the news you couldn't handle. Man, where you could just praise him in the midst of that and say, man, I don't know how you're going to work it out, but I know somehow you will and that you're still good. Man, I think I think that shakes the gates of hell. Yeah. That, that hope and trust. It's that life. Love and living water. And that's, and uh, he's such a good God, man. And he yeah. brings two dudes that would probably never be sitting from a table across from each other in any, any other kind of realm. And people clown on being a Christian stuffy or boring. Or, and I'm like, well, you ain't doing it right. Right. Because it's a wild, I mean, life's wild, period. But man, I got a whole family of God in my corner. Yeah. And I get to hang out with cool dudes like, like Dre, who's on his own journey, and learn from you. I don't care how young, <laughs> I don't care how young you are, or how old I am, or man, we're we're part iron of sharp as iron, man. It's absolutely, I love it. Yeah. Well, man, it's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. Sure, we could probably go on and on and on. I think we could. We might start getting some texts from the business. Yeah, but uh, I appreciate it, man. It's been a great conversation. Yes, sir. Uh, look up to you and your persistence in our community and just your heart. And, and, oh. and then even hearing how you've pushed through the adversary. Uh, and on the way up, man, on the upswing of it. Yeah. It's like, wait, I'm too old to go through this. That's encouraging. But no, we're never too old to learn. We're never too old to grow. And I've been able to connect with so many people. Who just thought it was it was over, man? It was helpless. Yeah, man. You know when you say that that situation has birthed probably a whole other ministry. Yep. Because now you can relate. Now you can. Yep. That's that, a big thing, man. When people's name gets dragged through the mud, that messes somebody up, dude. It's you know I mean, I'm connected to people who I can see like it's really hurt them. Yeah. And it's got them paralyzed. I was paralyzed for a, for a hot minute. That stupid, stupid saying, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt. That person was an idiot. And I don't know who said it. Somebody's probably going to be like, look it up and say, oh, this is a great. Probably the same thing you said about the uh, no drug free zones. Yeah. <laughs> probably some words hurt. Them. Yeah. They just, yeah, they just decided that no would be, fear. maybe if I just put that on my dashboard yeah. and say it enough. Everything that, will go away. Yeah. And it's like, no, words hurt, man. They matter. They matter. Life and death. Yep. In the power of the tongue says that great ships are steered by small rudders. So too is the tongue in a man's body. So what we say is life and mm. death. And I don't think we give that enough weight. But the words we speak to one another, iron sharpening iron, goes back to that. What's this generation need? They need they There's need a sharp. lot of weapons formed against that too, man. Yep. You know, it's so much more than the absence of speaking death. How, how many times do we sleep on speaking life to each other? Especially the people we're closest to. Yeah. Like to think that we got this power to speak life and we could do it. The Bible go to bed mad. Well, I'm just not going to do it. Or I'm period. just going to just tune out tonight, you know, watching a, a movie. I'm just going to tune out. I'm not going to speak anything. But to me, if you're not speaking anything, you might well, as well just. Let's declare and decree. Let's do it. Did that. Everybody watching too, if you're still watching, God bless you. We're yes. going to declare and decree right now that we're going to utilize the gifts that God has given us. To Amen. speak life over situations, our loved ones, and uh, do it in abundance. Amen. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you. See you guys.
Cool, man. It was a good one. I don't know about that, but...